Right, in this video we're going to take a look at a very important market, the commodities market. This is a, an introductory video, so we'll just look at what's traded in the commodity markets as far as investors are concerned and some of the key jargon. We'll also look at some of the differences between commodities and, say, shares or bonds. Uh, many of them are obvious, but they're worth bearing in mind if you're going to invest in this market. And thirdly, we'll take a quick look at the way that commodities are traded and the way that an investor uh, can access commodities. So, what are commodities? Well, we see them all around us. The commodities markets influence the price of a gallon of petrol every time you fill up your car, the cost of a cup of coffee, whether bought from Starbucks or made at home, the price of the electricity flowing into your house and into the office. So commodities markets matter. They have a big bearing on our day-to-day -day lives. Um, but they're also an interesting opportunity for investors. First of all, some jargon. What types of commodity do we have? Most people could list plenty of commodities, but in the markets they're generally broken down into uh, several types. First of all, you've got the, the metals. So, you have the, the non-precious metals. You have the lead, the copper, the nickel, the uh, aluminium, or aluminium if you prefer. And uh, those metals are commonly used by manufacturers and so on. So there's a market for trading large quantities of those non-precious metals. Then you have the precious metals. And precious metals can be broken down not by what you think is valuable, but actually by the market jargon and convention. So the precious metals are gold, which we talk about a lot at Money Week, silver, platinum, and the metal that you could make another wedding ring out of, but you'd also put into a catalytic converter, palladium. So those are the so-called four precious metals. And the metals are also known quite often as the hard commodities, for obvious reasons. Um, so that's one whole group. And actually in London there's an exchange that specialises largely in trading some of these metals. Okay, we also have what some people would call agricultural commodities. Um, and many people would call, loosely speaking, the softs. So there's a big market for buying and selling, the likes of cocoa, sugar, coffee, and so on, soybeans, uh, and so on. So those are the agricultural or soft commodities. Broadly speaking, kick one of those, it hurts. Kick one of those in a sack, and it probably doesn't, hence the language. And then over here, um, you've got what I'm going to call energy. Um, so over there, you've got oil, gas, and so on. So commodities, um, these aren't prescriptive definitions, but these labels are used quite often to describe groups of particular commodities. And uh, each of them have slightly different characteristics, slightly different markets in terms of where they're traded, and obviously slightly different users in terms of buyers and sellers. So that's the first thing, a little bit of jargon on the type of market we're looking at. Now, before you dive into commodities, and a lot of people do like to try and play commodities, it's, it looks like an exciting place, and it certainly is, um, you need to know a little bit about what makes a commodity different. Now, some of this is intuitive, but buying and selling commodities is not the same as buying and selling, say, shares or bonds, or simply opening up a bank account. Um, so, worth bearing that in mind, you know, what are some of the key sort of features we need to look out for in the commodities market that maybe we wouldn't worry about so much if I was just buying Tesco shares. And some of these features explain, in a nutshell, why the commodities market isn't for what I'd call widows and orphans. It's quite a high-risk place. Prices can be volatile, and that's because into the mixture with commodities, things that affect price, we've got a lot of different components. For example, features of commodities that you wouldn't worry about if you're buying shares. Um, they can be stolen and they perish. So you've got storage issues. Yeah, some commodities you can stick in a warehouse, take them out two years later, they look much the same. Gold, for example, except a warehouse is probably not a good idea, maybe a bank vault. But the same can't be said of corn. Some commodities are perishable and that means there is an aspect to commodity management that you don't get with, um, say, shares and bonds. 
that warehouses around the world specialise in storing commodities, making sure that if someone arrives with a warrant to buy X many tonnes of a particular commodity, the commodity is there in the right quantity and it hasn't all rotted. So that's one factor. Secondly, you've got delivery, security. Ships sink, lorries crash, things blow up. Not a problem when you're talking about the gilts market, let's say for government bonds, but definitely a problem with commodities. So, as a buyer and a seller, you've got to think about what you're going to pay to store a commodity, potentially, or what someone's got to pay, and what you've got to pay to insure it. You wouldn't normally have to insure um, a savings account or a Tesco share in quite the same way, um, but you do have to think about that in the commodities market. Next, of course, we've got politics. Commodities are volatile. One of the reasons is this. If you look at what's happening on the Ivory Coast at the moment, the Ivory Coast is responsible for around 40% of chocolate exports worldwide. So what happens there matters because it affects the supply of cocoa that goes into chocolate and therefore, you know, apart from the weather being an obvious factor, politics is a problem too. And the cocoa price has shot up around 12% this year already because of political problems um, over in the Ivory Coast. So if you're going to be in a commodities market and you want to understand what's going on, you need to start reading the news, you need to start getting interested in where these things are grown and produced. Again, not normally a problem with, say, FTSE 100 shares or gilts. And then, of course, you've got one other feature. There's no income. Um, if you buy a share, you might get a dividend. If you buy a gilt, you might get some interest. Stick your money in the bank, you probably also get some interest. Sadly, buy gold and you don't. So as an investor, you need to think about that. Most commodities are not going to be a source of regular income. If that's what you want from a safe investment, this is not the place to be. So common sense in a way, but we're just saying there are a number of factors that affect commodities that actually an investor in other markets wouldn't particularly lose sleep over. What's my point? The point is it makes the commodities market unpredictable quite volatile and really a market you need to kind of do some homework on if you're going to go down to the level of actually getting involved in trying to trade cocoa or silver or whatever it happens to be. Okay, so that might sound a bit scary. So I mean in practice, how are these things traded and how can a retail investor get some access to this market? Well, let's have a look at trading. First of all, we've got the professionals, as I might call it. So, around the world, there are some huge exchanges that specialise in trading commodities. Um, the sort of people that use these exchanges are big buyers and sellers, represented in New York, for example, or Chicago, at the mercantile exchanges, as they're called, or in London at the metals exchange. Um, so there are people interested in physically buying and selling large quantities of metals or wheat or pork bellies. But there are also a lot of speculators. Um, so trading um, in the professional, if you like, the wholesale market is done through the likes of the London Metals Exchange, the New York Mercantile Exchange or NYMEX, and the Chicago Board of Trade and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. This is not the full list, but around the world you've got exchanges based in most of the major cities and financial centres that just do commodities. And a lot of them still do the kind of waving around that you used to see more often in London on stock exchanges. So if you want to go and see active trading, people in colourful jackets, people shouting and using hand signals in pits, these are quite good places to go looking. Um, the London Metals Exchange, for example, is about the only exchange in London where the so-called open outcry method of trading still holds. It hasn't all been made electronic. How does that help you, though? As a retail investor, you're not about to go and become a member of the London Metals Exchange or join CBOT. That all sounds a bit inappropriate. So, for the retail market, there are two basic choices. Um, you could go for the commodity itself. You could do physical trades. Or more likely, you're going to buy some sort of fund. Um, People do buy gold, for example. I mean, you can buy gold coins and store them. Uh, the problem is you probably don't want to leave them at home. Uh, you want to store them somewhere more secure than that. 
Um, but for most people, physically buying and selling isn't practicable. I mean, yeah, by all means, have half a dozen gold coins at home, but not a ton of copper. So, in reality, most retail investors will go for some sort of fund. And there are funds around where either a fund manager specialises in going out and buying individual shares, perhaps linked to the commodities market, or you can get an exchange traded fund. Uh, and at Money Week, we quite like exchange traded funds. These are simply shares listed on exchange that track the price of a commodity or a group of commodities. Um, so, for example, you can get an ETF that tracks the gold price or the silver price or, or individual soft commodities or even baskets of them. And these tend to be fairly simple and fairly cheap. So, for a retail investor, the most likely route is the exchange traded fund route, let's say. But here, just be a little bit careful. Won't go into this in a lot of detail in this video, but with exchange traded funds, make sure that the ETF in the, in the documents that describe it, or the fact sheet, is actually tracking the physical commodity and isn't simply backed by a handful of dodgy sounding derivatives such as futures and swaps. So if you're going to pick up an ETF that tracks gold, for example, we quite like the ones that track physical gold and are backed by a holding of gold in a vault uh, rather than anything that sounds like it might be backed with a, a derivative. So, in summary, the commodities market uh, offers quite a lot of opportunity. There are lots of different assets to trade, grouped into the metals, the soft and the energy markets. Um, there are a number of factors you need to be aware of to trade commodities. It's not a place for a novice. You need to do a bit of homework first. And there are, in practice, many, many ways to trade commodities, a lot of which are not really open to a retail investor. So we're recommending, normally, that you go down the fund route. And um, when it's a fund that you're looking at, the best bet is to go for something relatively simple and relatively cheap. Um, in this case, the exchange-traded fund.